So I'm going to talk about Key West, and we'll start with a quote from a pretty well-known historian. He said as following, During the decades prior to the Civil War, Key West could be best understood as a cosmopolitan, even international island of economic, social, and cultural activity, unlike any other in Florida, have had, having little contact with it. In other words, he was saying it was a unique environment. And one thing we want to do as we go through uh, this evening is to ask the question, it, does Key West still have a unique environment? He said it was an international uh, island, and it was. Uh, in 1850, the most numerous immigrant group were those from the Bahamas, primarily whites, but also some blacks, uh, England, Ireland, Ireland, Germany, etc. Within the U.S., most of those living in Key West had actually been born in Florida, but many came from Connecticut, New York, and other northeastern states. Now, this is the population figures, and on one hand, there's just a few people in Key West in 1830 and 1840, but you see the big increase during the 1840s and in the 1850s. And in fact, in 1850, Key West was the second largest city in Florida, Pensacola was number one, and in 1860, basically Pensacola and Key West had the same, the two largest cities. So with small island, obviously, if you look at more recent figures, were relatively small compared to other Florida cities, but that was not the case at that point. Why not? What brought people to Key West? There were a variety of things, was commercial fishing, sponging, etc. But the main economic base of Key West in the decades prior to the Civil War was the wrecking industry. Ships carrying cargo and passengers, usually not passengers, but uh, crew and cargo would wreck on the Florida Reef. These wreckers would go out and rescue the crew, rescue the cargo, bring the cargo into Key West. If they could, they would bring the ship in and repair it. And much of the cargo that was brought in was then auctioned off. And for the major um, auctions, People would come in from Cuba, sometimes New York. It was a big deal, an opportunity for Key Westers to make a lot of money. And many did. The captains of the ships, the crew, other people involved, lawyers, accountants, uh, people loaded and unloaded the ships, etc. In fact, some people argue that Key West was the richest city per capita in the United States during some years and a couple of decades prior to the Civil War. No one could prove this, and it's probably not true, but it's repeated quite frequently, so I just thought I'd mention it. Um, what type of uh, cargo did they rescue? All kinds of things. Wine, silk, rum, coffee. Uh, the most unusual, by the way, there's no place for me to put my notes when I'm done with the page, so I'm just going to throw it on the floor and I'll pick it up afterwards, don't worry. Um, the perhaps the most unusual uh, item from the cargo was in 1827, they found an Egyptian mummy. Uh, I don't know how they discovered it exactly, but I know they unwrapped it and they found out it was a mummy, but it smelled real bad, so they burned it. Uh, they, they didn't auction it off. <laughs> there was another way that some Key Westers made uh, money in the decades prior to the Civil War, and this was through slavery. In 1830, as Sharon Wells has shown in a very wonderful book, there were more free slaves, free blacks, I'm sorry, than slaves in Key West. 1840 was roughly equal. By 1850 and 1860, many, many more blacks were slaves than free. And blacks were about 25-30% of the population. And what happened is a lot of Key Westers would purchase slaves and lease them to the U.S. Corps of Engineers, and they would use the slave labor to, to build Fort Taylor and uh, Fort Jefferson. The wrecking industry declined uh, significantly after the Civil War. And many people felt that Key West would lose population. It had lost the mainstay of its economy. But that wasn't the case at all. In fact, it grew significantly. In 1880, it was the largest city in Florida. 
in 1890 still. What was going on here? Well, for one thing, commercial fishing was still relatively big. Uh, the sponging industry really grew, uh, turtling as well. And many people came from the Bahamas, whites and blacks, and worked in the maritime industry. By the way, I should mention, a part of the, what they did when they fished, one of the things they fished for, I guess you say, were conchs, these little fish. I don't really know what they look like or anything. But I just mention that because over time, Key West natives were called conchs, right? I think they still are. Um, but the key to the growth of Key West's economy after the Civil War was the cigar industry. You had small cigar factories in Key West prior to the Civil War, but very small. Now you start to get very large cigar factories. Samuel Seidenberg opened up this factory in 1868, employed hundreds of workers. And many of the cigar manufacturers also provided housing for the workers. I don't know if any of you have been to Tampa, because you have Ybor City there. Vicente Martinez Ibor, a, a Spaniard who then moved to Q West, uh, went to Cuba, got involved in the uh, tobacco industry and making cigars. Then he moved to Q West before he moved up to Tampa. Cubans came to Key West in very large numbers to work in the cigar factories. They came during the 10-year war for the uh, Cuban independence from Spain, 1868 to 1878, and they continue coming afterwards. And it appears that by 1885, Cubans had surpassed Bahamians as the most numerous ethnic group in Key West. And Key West generally developed a diverse population, just as they had before the Civil War. So you had the Cubans, you had the Bahamians. A relatively small Jewish population also moved to Key West from Romania, Russia, Poland, and a variety of other countries. Uh, Key Western named Arlo Hasco wrote a very uh, outstanding book uh, going into great deal, detail about this. In 1877, there were probably only about 50 Jewish families, but that increased significantly over the next couple of decades. In fact, some got involved in the cigar industry. Seidenberg was Jewish. More commonly, they were Jews were peddlers, and then some opened up stores on Duval Street. Key West black residents were about 30% of the population. Many were from the Bahamas, though also some Afro-Cubans. Historian Cantor Brown notes the complexity of relationships among different ethnic and racial groups in Key West during this period of time. The cosmopolitan population mix often produced public brawls, but also created and fostered relatively tolerant patterns of race relations. In 1895, a reporter for a widely read African-American newspaper in Florida said, we know no other city in the United States where the Negro enjoys his liberty to a greater extent than in Key West. And Key West black and Cubans, blacks and Cubans, sometimes formed electoral alliances that elected Cubans and blacks to public office. I also should mention that no blacks served on the Key West City Council from 1908 until 1971. Also, Key West schools were segregated, as was the case throughout Florida. That was a state law. And places of public accommodations were segregated to a significant extent as well. By 1910, it was pretty clear that the cigar industry was not going to continue to be the future. And we'll move on from there. But what I did was touch this by mistake. These are some people who came to Key West, and I make a lot of mistakes. Uh, these people came to Key West, observed it, and for the most part, they viewed it as a very unique environment. This is kind of during the heyday of the cigar industry. This guy, George Barber, used to report, be a reporter in Chicago. Everything in and about Key West is strange, foreign, and interesting. Another writer, a quaint and charming city full of oddities and incongruities. Key West is an odd and novel place, intensely unlike any other place in the Union. Again, a unique environment. Now, not everyone loved the place. Key West is a dusty old town. There's very little of interest here to hold the tourists, so you can't please everyone. But many came to Key West and found it a very unique, fascinating place. Just as an aside, another person not too impressed with Key West was Mark Train, but I think he was hard to impress in general. He didn't like the food. So, by 1910, the cigar industry had waned to a very significant extent for a wide variety of reasons. And employment decreased, the economy decreased. Many expected, however, that 
Key West would change dramatically in terms of employment, in terms of business activity, in terms of a tourism with the arrival of Henry Flagger's Florida East Coast Railway in 1912. The Panama Canal was being built and opened in 1914 and many expected that Key West would prosper dramatically. Freighters and passenger ships would soon travel to and from the Panama Canal, and more tourists as well would come by train to Key West. At the banquet held on a Flagler after the overseas railway reached Key West, Flagler predicted that Key West's population would reach 50,000 within a decade. It came nowhere close to that um, for a variety of reasons. Key West economy did not grow dramatically due to the opening of the uh, Panama Canal and the expansion of the railroad. And even in terms of tourism, it was quite limited during this decade, 1910 to 1920. That was okay with a lot of people. One person said when it appeared that the railroad might ch dramatically change Key West in terms of tourism, in terms of the economy, the whistle of the locomotive will be heard in the land and another queer corner of the earth will be put on a civilized map by Query Med uh, Unique. In the 1920s, Key West Chamber of Commerce, elected officials, and many others felt that they had to go full scale into tourism because there wasn't much else going on. So the Key West citizen, a big tourist booster, said, and one of these days, so many tourists will want to spend the winter here that accommodations must be provided for them. And many of them will build themselves resulting in a boom that was in realty values sky high in Key West. We know this never happened, of course. <laughs> Chamber of Commerce put out a brochure speaking about the uniqueness of Key West. This is why you should come. The architecture of the houses gives an old world charm and foreign atmosphere to Key West, an exotic place. The island has as much personality as New Orleans an atmosphere intangible and indefinable, and so on. This is what they hope would draw tourists. Um, there's more than many attractions here specifically for tourism. Casa Marine opened up January 1st, 1921. La Contra will open up in 1926. It was six stories, the tourist building in Key West. This is a Labor Day parade in the early 1930s. By then it changed the name uh, temporarily to the Colonial. But again, Key West didn't attract all that many tourists, uh, more than before, but it was not a key tourist destination. It wasn't a Miami and wherever else uh, people went in Southeast Florida at that time. Again, for many people, that was fine. George Allen England was an explorer. He was a science fiction writer. He loved Key West. Key West is different from all the cities, filled with beauty and curious, unique pictures. Again, unique. Somewhat a state of mind, unique and unapproachable, saved by those who love and understand the tropics. T. Key West's understanding arts is hearts, sorry, and souls is more than can be written down in words. It's amazing how often I've looked at that slide and just noticed uh, two hours ago that I had it wrong. <laughs> it's not that amazing if you know me. <laughs> Ernest Hemingway came to Key West initially 1928. As you know, he'd been in Paris in the 1920s. Uh, he had met his second wife there, P Pauline, Pauline Pfeiffer. Uh, they decided to come back to the United States. They took a ship, Cuba, then to Key West. Hemingway immediately decided he loved the place. It's the best place I've ever been anytime, anywhere. And he'd been in Paris in the 20s. Uh, flowers and so on and so forth. Cut tight last night in absinthe and did knife tricks. I noticed that absinthe for a while was illegal in the United States, but now it's legal again, I understand. So he was here for a little while. He did fishing with some buddies and so on and so forth. He left um, to go up to uh, Arkansas, where Pauline was from, and then he came back. And they purchased the Hemingway, what became known as the Hemingway House, in 1931, a pretty substantial structure. And again, he enjoyed Key West a lot. I guess there was no bullfighting, but there was cockfighting. He liked going to that. Uh, he went to boxing matches. He sparred himself. He refereed. Uh, he loved going to Sloppy Joe's, which is where Captain Tony's um, is today, before it moved to where Sloppy Joe's is today, and so on and so forth. But most people didn't have Hemingway's economic level at that point or his lifestyle. This was, this was a more typical, perhaps, 
Key West home. The fact is, by 1930, 31, maybe even a little earlier, Key West had no economy. It didn't have scar factories. It didn't have the, uh, the Navy bases that it had to some degree earlier. Unemployment was sky high. Vast majority of the people were on relief, which really wasn't all that generous. So the question is what to do. Key West uh, city government had no money. So what it did was abdicate governing authority to the state of Florida. State of Florida didn't have any money either. So Governor Schultz basically gave governing authority over Key West to Julius Stone, who is the Florida Administrator of FERA, the, Florida, the Federal I'm sorry, Emergency Relief Administration. He formed the Key West Administration, kind of a governing authority of sorts. And they tried to figure out what can we do to improve the situation with, within Key West. They thought about a couple of things. One was to move everyone out and send them to Tampa and some other places, which probably didn't make that much sense, which they realized. So the goal clearly became unequivocally to make Key West a tourist destination. And they did a variety of things to try to bring this about. For example, they started an arts project. Many artists came to Key West. They drew murals and so on. But more importantly, they took pictures of the paintings and put them on brochures and postcards and distributed them widely in Key West and the Northeast to try to encourage people to come. Also, they renovated more than 200 residents into guest houses. They built some cabanas on the beach. And also they published a guidebook enumerating 46 points of interest, including Hemingway's house, which Hemingway was not very happy about. It. He did not like Julia Stone one bit. Um, apparently he didn't like the New Deal. I don't, I don't understand Hemingway's politics. I won't even try to figure them out. Um, but tours did come in 34, 35. It was a pretty successful uh, tourism season. Uh, many took the train, some drove. The, the overseas highway had been completed to some extent in the late 20s, but it had a 40 mile gap, so you had to drive and put your car on a ferry. It really wasn't that fun a drive. It was pretty long. Uh, but again, it was relatively su successful in terms of attracting tourism. But then you had that terrible hurricane, Labor Day 1935. And that did decrease tourism a bit for the 35, 36 season. But still, it didn't go down as much as you might expect. And it still was higher than, than it had been in the previous years. So tourists kept on coming, and many thought that Key West would continue to be a tourist destination. One person who came to Key West was Elizabeth Bishop. She first visited in 1936, and then she moved to Key West in 1938 with a partner, Louise Crane, a classmate from Vassar College, and she bought a house on White Street. Uh, she moved from Key West in 46, but she spoke, uh, came back periodically, and she spoke very positively of it in general, in terms of the friendliness of the people, etc. So it's truly quite amazing. You have Hemingway, maybe the top novel novelist of the 20th century. Uh, Bishop was one of the, clearly one of the top poets of the 20th century, and we're going to see more along those lines shortly. You never know when tourists are going to visit a place. Um, Key West administration advertised. A lot of people came because of advertising. But in 1940, a main reason many tourists traveled to Key West had little to do with those efforts. Rather, they were lured by publicity regarding the bizarre relationship between Count Carl von Kassel and Elena Malegro Hoyas. Van Kassel, the name adopted by George Carl Tanger, arrived in Key West in 26. The German-born X-ray technician was employed in the Marine Hospital, which treated both military and civilian people. In 1930, Elena, a 21-year-old Key Wester whose parents had moved to the island from Cuba, arrived in the hospital for tests. Van Kassel fell in love with her and was certain Elena was the woman he had dreamt about several years before she was even born. She was destined to be his wife and partner for the rest of his life. The fact that Elena died of tuberculosis in October 31 did not end his dream. Instead, he secretly removed her body from the mausoleum in the Key West Cemetery, tried to restore it with wax, plaster of Paris, and glass eyeballs, and slept next to it in his home from 1933 until it was discovered in 1940. And though authorities eventually decided not to press charges against Valcasso for stealing the body because the statute of limitations had expired, the national newspaper accounts of the public caring to determine whether charges should be filed and the public viewing of Elena's body, the funeral home, drew many tourists to Key West. Apparently, most of them sympathized with Van Castle, at least that's what they say. He also found a way to make money from his sudden fame by charging visitors 25 cents to visit his house and hear his story. 
So when we asked whether Key West was unique, this is kind of a unique story. <laughs> yeah, by the way, he wrote a diary. I bought it, I was going to read it, but I just thought it would be, you know, whatever, too weird. Um, <laughs> there is some very good work about Key West. Uh, ben Harrison um, wrote a very nice book. By 1943, the Key West Chamber of Commerce is telling people to stay away. Tourists don't come to Key West. Why not? Because the military had filled all the available accommodations. Key West became a Navy town. By 1945, there were 13 Navy personnel here. And from this point until late 60s, maybe early 70s, the military was the key driver of growth and uh, employment in the, on the island. Commercial fishing had been significant early in the 1900s, actually in the 1800s. It became still more significant, perhaps, beginning in 1949, when they found sh uh, jumbo shrimp in the waters around Key West, pink gold. And these are shrimp boats that, with the Key West bite, I think is now called the historic seaport. Harry Truman loved Key West. He visited here 11 times with November 1946 and March 52 on what he called work and vacations. He wrote his wife at one point, I've got a notion to move the capital to Key West and just stay here. He didn't do that. But you did get a lot of publicity about Key West because he was covered very widely, of course, by the news media. The Chamber of Commerce advertised very widely about Key West, about Truman's love for the island. They put out brochures highlighting pretty much what the brochures of 1920 and other earlier periods uh, emphasized that was good about the city. Unique, exotic, almost foreign. We don't know how many tourists came to Key West in the 50s and 60s, but the estimate is maybe about 200,000 a year. This is much more than was the case in the 1930s, but as you well know, uh, much more was to come. Uh, you didn't get that many more tourist accommodations in the 50s and 60s. The Casa Marie and La La Concha, for example, were closed during almost all of this time. Dorothy Raymer, a newspaper columnist for the citizen after the Key West citizen after World War II, described the culture of Key West as kind of lazy fear or live and let live. And this created a type of environment that was very uh, open to um, open and um, to the pleasure of many creative people, artists, writers, and so on. It also, by the way, um, led to a tremendous amount of gambling, drinking, and so on. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the game Bolita. It's a numbers game that was very big uh, throughout Florida. That was very big in Key, in Key, Key West. That's where we are um, during this period and even earlier. But again, this lazy fair live and let live was very attractive to many creative people. Tennessee Williams. 1941, the first time he visited Key West. Friday morning I was in Miami, and Saturday night I was in Sloppy Joe's Bar in Key West. This is the most fantastic place that I've ever been yet in America. More colorful than San Francisco, New Orleans, or Santa Fe. Tennessee Williams would not have been comfortable in most cities in Florida, certainly most small towns, most cities for that matter, in the United States. He was outgoing, gay, and not in the closet. But he moved to Key West, purchasing a house on Duncan Street in 1950, and he stayed here until 1983 when he died, though of course he traveled a great deal. He enjoyed swimming and the climate that allowed it all year. Once when asked what he found attractive about Key West, he responded to the Navy. He wrote that the Navy is literally swarming with men in uniform, mostly sailors in white pants. It is extremely interesting. James Leo Hurley was friends with Tennessee Williams. He came and became a went down and went to resident. He also was gay. He wrote a Midnight Cowboy. The town excited me too much. The place was mysterious, funky, and so on and so forth. Again, a unique environment that he loved. <laughs> Tom McGrain on the left. He was a winter resident of Key West of 1969 through, I think, all of the 70s, or most of the 70s. Uh, he, they made a film out of his novel, 92 in the Shade, in Key West that drew a lot of attention. Truman Capote never lived here, but he spent a lot of time here. Tennessee Williams, James Kirkwood Jr., who was the co-author of the play A Chorus Line. Kirkwood suggested the island was not Florida, maybe not even America, but a country in a state of mind. It's the end of the line, even the world. 
started in 1968 when the Pay House opened. Many artists and writers stayed there for a period of time, and sometimes they then purchased a house in Key West. David Wolkowski, a third generation Key Wester, built the Pay House. He moved out, his family moved out of Key West when he was very young. They lived in Miami, spent time in Philadelphia, got involved in development efforts in Miami. When his dad died in 1962, he moved back. Um, he inherited properly, including the place where Captain Tony's is today. He got involved in some uh, redevelopment efforts in Key West, but his main point, the main point I want to make is he built the pier house. It drew a lot of attention to Key West. He had close ties with newspaper writers in Miami and the Northeast. He got much publicity for the hotel and Key West in general. He was close friends with many writers and artists, and the pier house became the places to stay when they came here. It also had the chat room, which was quite popular, a bar. Jimmy Muff Buffett drove down here in 1971 with Jerry Jeff Walker. Living in Key West in the early 70s was not like living in America, a hybrid culture. You were linked to the future by FedEx. Cuban coffee kept alive the flavor of the ethnic past. There were drug smugglers, and there were. Gay community discovered Key West, and you had shrimpers. It was an interesting place. He obviously loved it. In terms of drug dealing, it was widespread. This is Bum Farto. He was the Key West police chief. He was arrested in 1975 for being involved in the marijuana and cocaine drug trade, which included selling drugs from fire stations. He was found guilty in February 76 and faced a long prison term. Before his sentencing, he rented a car and told his wife he was going up to uh, Miami on a business trip. He never returned to Key West. No one ever knew what happened. They found his car in Miami a month or so later. All kinds of rumors spread. Uh, some he had fled to Brazil. Some said he had gone to Costa Rica. Others said that certainly other people in the mob had killed him. Other people in the drug business had killed him. But regardless, a famous or a popular t-shirt in Key West, where is Bum Fardo? Became very, very popular. Uh, not to be outdone, his sister uh, Key West police chief was um, convicted of drug trading um, as well in 1985 in what were called the uh, Bubba Trials. Some argued, look, this is bad, all this drug trafficking. It'll deter tourists to, from coming to Key West. What well, I'll see, David Wachowski disagreed. Intrigued, you know, is what Key West is about. It'll probably attract people here. Also, I should mention, with the demise, the weakening uh, of the military in the late 60s, and then what is now called Truman Annex, that may be based close in, in the mid-70s, um, the economy in Key West was very, very weak. So probably what kept it alive, in a certain sense, what stimulated, at least, was the drug trade. People go and buy a car with cash, you know, they buy boats with cash, and so on and so forth. You know, that's the way it worked. I noticed there's a big uh, stash of cocaine that was found a couple of days ago, somewhere up the Keys, so I guess maybe uh, some of it still goes on. The gays moved to Key West in large numbers in the 70s and 80s, actually the 60s as well. Obviously, there was a gay population here, here with Tennessee Williams, etc. One of the reasons uh, some moved, according to this uh, in-mover, was people are gay, feel like outsiders in a lot of places. In Key West, it's just opposite. You feel you are on the inside here. And this relates to that live, and, that live culture that we mentioned before. Many got involved in renovating homes in Old Town, and you got a type of uh, gentrification. Also, um, gay in-movers got involved in a number of activities in Key West, including running for office. This is Richard Hyman. Uh, he was elected to the City Commission in 1979. He was elected mayor of Key West in 1983. He was the first openly gay mayor elected in the United States. He stepped down in 85, but then he was elected again in 87. And it's interesting, in 87, he won easily over a pretty popular con who had been mayor before. Um, of course, Hyman won the gay precincts very heavily, but he also did very well in other precincts as well. It's very, very interesting. Many gay in-movers opened guest houses. There were 52 of them or thereabouts by 1982. So, and gays more generally got involved in promoting tourism. I don't think I have to say much about this. This is Fantasy Fest. A number of gay uh, business people, for the most part, promoted it. First one in 1979. It was nothing like today. I think there were 17 floats. Um, they did have sister, I think her name was. She was wearing only body paints and she was on the hood of a Lincoln or 
some other car, I don't know, um, that drew some attention. Uh, but again, it obviously was going to be much, much more before too long in terms of attracting tourists. But that was the goal, tourism. Now, in 1981, people in Key West passed a referendum and it imposed a bed tax on tours of state hotels, motels, etc. And it formed the Tourist Development Council, which began to advertise to bring people to Key West. This is pretty significant. Now we're saying Key West unequivocally had decided upon the tourism strategy. So Mayor Dennis Wardlow, um, Ed Swift, who was president of the Chamber of Commerce, and others were extremely upset when in 1982, the U.S. Border Patrol imposed a roadblock on U.S. 1 around Florida City. So anybody driving up U.S. 1 from Key West was going to have to wait for hours and hours while they search cars and so on. They said they were looking for um, illegal aliens, was I think the terminology they used. Um, they obviously, obviously were talking about uh, looking for drugs as well. So Wardley did the only logical thing. He says that Key West is going to secede from the Union. He gave the advance notice. We're going to declare war, fire one shot, surrender, and then ask one billion dollars in federal aid. And he stuck to his word. Key West declared it was seceding from the Union on April 23rd, 1982, and forming the Conch Republic. He surrendered a few minutes later, but not before the Conch Republic's Minister of Defense hit a U.S. Navy officer with a loaf of Cuban bread, his version of having fired a volley. So again, most towns wouldn't, wouldn't secede like this, a kind of a unique step. But again, the goal was to draw publicity and to bring more tours to Key West. So the TDC came up with a variety of slogans. Visit America's favorite Caribbean island. Uh, come as you are, whatever that might mean. Close to perfect, far from normal. I think that's the same one. They say uh, far from normal. Again, they're trying to say it's a unique uh, environment, perfect. Uh, that's not, again, the eyes of the beholder. And they had a lot to say about Key West to try to get people to come down. Beautiful uh, an island, fishing, water sports, and so on and so forth. You go to Mallory Square, you see these people do whatever they uh, do there. Hemingway Days, this became uh, quite popular. Um, about the time of Hemingway's birthday, uh, people could ride the con train uh, owned by Historic Toys of America, which is very big in the tourism business in Key West, as you know. Not everyone, however, was entirely with this goal of bringing more and more tourists, which in turn would bring more hotels, motels, and so on. Among those not very happy with it was Captain Tony Tarasino. He had moved to Key West in 1962. Uh, he said the ma from New Jersey, he said the mafia was after him for some reason. He had a lot of stories. Uh, he did open up uh, Captain Tony's, it was the first place where um, Sloppy Joe's was located. Uh, most people don't know, I don't think, that he was elected mayor of Key West in 1989. He had run in 1985. His slogan was, he'll stop the big construction and have no peace for folks who want Key West to look like Miami Beach. That was actually a song. Uh, he also said the following. He opposed the building of the Reach uh, that ultimately was built in 1985, and so did many others in Key West. He said the following. There's another beach, I'm sorry, the Reach is on, uh, where is it, the Atlantic side around Simonton, I think? Uh, there's another beach to take it away from us. Once they open up cabanas and everything, forget the public. In two weeks, they'll say kids are urinating in the sand, drinking beer, smoking drugs, fornicating. They'll set up a couple of phony fights and that's it. They'll put the fences up. So he saw, it. the point was Key West was changing, outside money was coming in, the character of the town would change. He was inaugurated in 1989. He said very explicitly, Key West was not your normal town in the U.S. People come here looking for their utopias, dreamers, artists, people with high IQs, making beads, painting, fishing, whatever. They all come here for the little paradise in the sun. Then look at all these big hotels. It's all built on paper. And they stop making money to pull out and leave the stakeholders. These are the people going to tell us what the rules are, how to live here. They're strangers. Again, Key West is changing in a way they found undesirable. Power was shifting. Big money was coming in. The uniqueness was um, withering. People thinking about Key West, the changes in Key West um, had a real um, concern when they knocked down the Atlantic Shores uh, Motel around 2007. 
It was built in the 1950s, a relatively small and expensive hotel. It was upgraded to some extent later on. Uh, it was very, very popular. It was to some degree associated with the gay and lesbian population, but many spring breakers went there. Um, they did have a sign, we don't discriminate against heterosexuals, and so on. Um, they had a cold and optional pool. Uh, many people seemed to be attracted uh, to that. It was a place where people felt very comfortable. One person noted, it's a Key West institution. Go there, get a drink, talk with some really nice people. It's a really nice place. Um, now, it's kind of, now it's closing. Where, where are we going to go? A drag queen said, it's the end of an era. They did build another hotel there, motel, I'm sorry, but it was very much more upscale, more traditional, more expensive. One person used to go to Atlantic Shores said, uh, uh, yes, a motel for place to motel, but this new place has no heart or soul. It's just a money-making machine. Sunset Key, very expensive homes there, developed in the 1990s, and some cottages as well associated. It had been associated with the Western. I'm not sure what the story is now. I do know they're very expensive. I called them up, and it was uh, too expensive. Corey wouldn't pay for it. The Key West Spice changed dramatically. By 1990s, the shrimp boats were gone, and you had uh, tourism-related uh, boats stocked there. Charter fishing boats, dive boats, crafts used for uh, excursions. Uh, some Key Westers parked their boats, I guess they docked their boats there. I don't know if these are yachts or, I'm not sure. But I know they're not uh, shrimp boats. And also, I'm sure some uh, tourists had their boats there as well. Cruise ships started to come to the Key West in relatively large numbers, which was quite controversial. You can see the increase in cruise ships in the 1980s, 1990s, 46,086, going up to 609,000. That's a big increase. I also put the number of uh, people coming by plane. There was an increase there as well, but here I'm, I'm focusing on cruise ships. Many people, cruise uh, ship passengers coming to Key West. Uh, many in Key West didn't like this at all. They argued there might be environmental degradation associated with the big ships. They argued that all these passengers would come off, hang around to Wall Street, do whatever, kind of interfere with the laid back nature of the town. Um, here, uh, many tourists and residents would not like the cruise ship passengers uh, go to the, all the bars and t shirt shops and whatever. Um, others really pushed for cruise ships. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce saying we don't want anything to interfere with the increased number of cruise ships coming in. The conch train obviously benefited. Some businesses along uh, Duval benefit, and so on. Cruise ships did not decrease in terms of number of passengers disembarking. Over a million in 2003 uh, didn't go up from there, but still very significant numbers. And the continued controversy, I know that's going on today. By the way, we have these figures, you should add two or 300,000 to them because they don't count the crews and large number of crew members disembark as well. The totals don't add to overnight and crews because I left off the day trippers. We don't know how many day trippers came, but two, two 300,000 a year is a good guess. So more cruise ship passengers, more overnight people as well, staying in hotels, motels, guest houses, vacation rentals became very, very popular, etc. Key West was a, unequivocally, and is a tourist town. Some were too Im impressed with the changes in Key West, basically saying it lo lost its uniqueness. USA Today, the droves and development are threatening the very things that make the continent of USA's southernmost islands so popular. Quirky charm, laid back pace, crystal clear waters. Um, Flo the photos, Florida 2009 edition, had some not very positive things to say. And then there's Carl Heisen, who has cried away with words, as you know. If Hemingway were alive today, he'd take a flamethrower to Duval Street. Not everyone looked negatively at developments in Key West. Island Magazine, 1994, for one reason or another, ranked Key West among the 10 most desirable islands to visit in the world. Uh, Florida Magazine did a poll of its readers. I don't know who reads it, but Duval Street, ranked as Florida's best Main Street in 2009. I think that was the third straight year. A street with a rhythm all of its own, including souvenir shops, famous art galleries, bars, boutique shops, seafood restaurants, and the theaters. So people have different ideas. One human family. To the year 2000, this was the motto adopted by the Key West Commission for Key West. 
Key West is an island, island community that's passionate about all, all living together as caring, sharing neighbors. And each of us are dedicated to making a home as close to paradise as we can. We want to proclaim that the truth as we see it is that there is no them, there is just us, all of us, together as one human family, now and forever. And in some ways, unequivocally, Key West was and is one human family. This is the gay pride uh, flag down the length of Duval Street in 2003. Sushi, 25 straight chairs, New Year's Eve. Uh, this apparently was her last drop, she said, until uh, 25 years from now, she said she's going to come back <laughs> for an encore. What challenges this notion of one human family in Key West? is its affordability, or lack thereof. And I, sorry I'm giving you a bunch of numbers, but I am. Um, this is median value of unoccupied homes in Key West over a number of years, and in Florida. Look at Key West in 1960. The median value of homes was actually lower than the state of Florida. It was a moderate um, price community, a moderate income residence. 1970 as well. I saw advertisements for Newtown in 1960, homes 17,000, 18,000, 19,000 a year. And also you had the Navy base provide um, housing for many of its service people, many of whom were married, and some of the spouses worked in the public and private sectors. So the military provided affordable housing for many people as well. This began to change. You can see a significant change in the 1970s. 70s, we spoke about the renovation of homes, the upgrading of Old Town, what some might call gentrification, um, increased prices during the 80s, 90s, and it's clear what has happened. This is the median value. I spoke to a realtor a few days ago. She says what she sells now is generally well over a million dollars. It's become a very expensive town to buy. It's a very expensive town to rent in. When the Navy base closed, some had hopes that you would redevelop the area into mixed-use housing where people of different income groups could afford to buy and rent. But what Duffy, the legal service attorney, suggested, what you have instead is that we have a swapping of a plan to have this mixed environment for a pale, sterile, merely passable, wealthy getaway. They did build some housing on Tr Truman Annex that was affordable, meant to be affordable, but it didn't seem to stay that way for long. Jimmy Weekly, former mayor. I hate to see people doing that. In other words, leaving Key West because we're losing our history. He's talking about conks moving out. This began in the 1970s, not just in uh, when he spoke this, but this is something that went on continually. Um, there were big Key West uh, conch reunions around Ocala, around Key West, uh, sorry, around Tampa and so on. These are people who used to live in Key West. Ty Zembrowski was the city planner. A lot, of these, a lot of these people leaving are regularly local people. And when they sell, they are not selling their housing to people like them. They're selling to people who will not be regularly local people, where community is not replacing itself. And I think what he's talking about is many people buying in Key West are uh, not primary homeowners. They say second home, third home, fourth home. And they're building up the price of housing. Now, many of them get involved in the community. Uh, many are very generous in terms of supporting not-for-profits, uh, cultural institutions, and so on. But again, it's a clearly a different part uh, type of town. Some say losing its uniqueness, becoming more like maybe Martha's Vineyard, which I don't really know anything about, but I just picture it as a very upscale community. <laughs> Elmer Davis, 1929, said, Once tourists come in number, Land will be worth, he's a writer, land will be worth more, rents will be higher. That narrow gap which separates the possible enjoyments of the poorest man in Key West from those of the richest man will broaden and broaden. Richard Wilbur, a very famous uh, poet who moved to Key West, a winter resident, um, in the 1960s, I think, said, I hope Key West always remains a place where you can live without being rich. Increasingly, Davis's fears will be unrealized, and Wilbur's hope was being dashed. Today, Key West is in some ways too unique, but uniqueness lies within a vastly different context than before its transition to a tourism and vacation home community. The Key West of today is, to a large extent, a reinvented community. It's by no means the Key West of the cigar makers and the descendants of Hemingway or Buffett, but it has managed to maintain a sense of place. 
This place, however, is open to a far smaller cross-section of the population than was the case in earlier decades. The tension between mass tourism, outside money, and local culture that evolved with the influx of newcomers continues. The island provides a welcome environment for many residents and visitors. Others, however, including past and present residents, both conks and transplants, as well as visitors to the city in earlier decades, bemoan the Key West that is gone. Thank you.